Chapter 18 Over and over, though he knew the number only too well, Matt counted his notch sticks. He kept hoping he had made a mistake. Always they were the same, ten sticks. That meant that August had long since gone by. He couldn't remember exactly how many days belonged to each month, but any way he reckoned it, the month of September must be almost over. He only needed to look about him. The maple trees circling the clearing flamed scarlet. The birches and aspens glowed yellow, holding a sunlight of their own, even on misty days. The woods had become quieter. Jays still screamed at him, and chickadees twittered softly in the trees, but the songbirds had disappeared. Twice he had heard a faraway trumpeting and had seen long straggles of wild geese like trailing smoke high in the air, moving south. In the morning when he stepped out of the cabin, the frosty air nipped his nose. The noonday was warm as midsummer, but when he came inside at dusk, he hurried to stir, stir up the fire. There was a chilliness inside him as well that neither the sun nor the fire ever quite reached. It seemed to him that day by day the shadow of the forest moved closer to the cabin. Why was his family so late in coming? He was troubled too because the autumn weather seemed to have brought about a restlessness in Atien. There were days when the Indian boy did not come. He never offered a word of explanation. After a day or two, he would simply walk into the cabin and sit down at the table. He rarely suggested that they hunt or fish together. Day after day, Matt tramped the woods alone, trying to shake the doubts that walked beside him like his own shadow. As he walked, Matt was careful to cut blazes in the bark of trees. They gave him courage to walk farther into the forest than he had ever dared before, since he was sure of finding his way back to the cabin. He also watched for Indian signs, and sometimes he was sure he had detected one. One day, looking up, he saw on a nearby tree the sign of the turtle. Time to turn back, he told himself. He felt secure now in the territory of the beaver, but he wasn't so certain that a strange people would welcome a white trespasser. As he started to retrace his steps, he heard, some distance away, the sharp, high-pitched yelp of a dog. It didn't sound threatening, but neither did it sound like the happy, excited bark of a hound that had scented a rabbit. It sounded almost like the scream of a child. When it came again, it died away into a low whining, and he remembered the tra trapped fox. Atien had warned him to have nothing to do with a turtle trap. But he hesitated, and the sound came again. No matter what Atien had told him, he could not bring himself to walk away from that sound. Warily, he made his way through the brush. It was a dog, a scrawny Indian dog, dirt caked and bloody. As Matt moved closer, he saw through the blood, the white streak down the side of its face, then the chewed ear and the stubby porcupine quills. Only one dog in the world looked like that. It was caught by its foreleg, just as the fox had been, and it was frantic with pain and fear. Its eyes were glazed, and white foam dripped from its open jaws. Matt felt his own muscles tense with anger. His mind was made up in an instant. It had been bad enough to leave a fox to suffer. Turtle tribe or no, he was not going to walk away from Atien's dog. Somehow he had to get that dog out of the trap. But how? As he bent down, the dog snapped at him so ferociously that he jumped back. Even if it recognized him, Atien's dog had never learned to trust him. Now it was too crazed to understand that Matt meant to help. Matt set his teeth and stooped again. This time he got his hands on the steel bands of the trap and gave a tug. With a deep growl, the dog snapped at him again. Matt started, scraping his hand against the steel teeth. He leaped to his feet and stared at the red gash that ran from his knuckles to his wrist. It was no use, he realized. There was no way he could get that trap open with the dog in this maddened state. Somehow he would have to find Atien. 
He began to run through the forest, back over the way he had come, back along the trails he knew, searching his memory for the signs he remembered that led to the Indian village. Luck was with him. There was the sign of the beaver cut into a tree, and here were the fallen logs. He was never absolutely sure, but he knew he walked in the right direction. And after nearly an hour, to his great relief, he came out on the shore of the river. There was no canoe waiting, as there had been when Atien had led him there. But the river was narrow and placid. Thank goodness he had grown up near the ocean, and his father had taken him swimming from the time he could walk. He left his moccasins hidden under a bush and plunged in. In a few moments, he came out dripping within sight of the stockade. He was greeted by a frenzied barking of dogs. They burst through the stockade and rushed toward him, halting only a few feet away, menacing him so furiously that he dared not take another step. Behind them came a group of girls who quieted the dog, dogs with shrill cries and blows. I have come for Hatien, Matt said when he could make himself heard. The girls stared at him, tired, wet, and ashamed of showing his fear of the dogs, Matt could not summon up any politeness or dignity. Atienne, he repeated impatiently. One girl, bolder than the others, answered him, flaunting her knowledge of the white man's language. Atienne not here, she told him. Then Sacnis. Sacnis not here, all gone hunt. Desperately, Matt seized his only remaining chance. Atien's grandmother, he demanded. I must see her. The girls looked at each other uneasily. Matt pulled back his shoulders and tried to put into his voice the stern authority that belonged to Sacnis. It is important, he said. Please show me where to find her. Amazingly, his blustering had an effect. After some whispering, the girls moved back out of his way. Come, the leading girl ordered, and he followed her through the gate. He was not surprised that she led him straight to the most substantial cabin in the clearing. He had recognized on the night of the feast that Sacnis was a chief. Now facing him in the doorway was a figure even more impressive than the old man. She was an aging woman, gaunt and wrinkled, but still handsome. Her black braids were edged with white. She stood erect, her lips set in a forbidding line, her eyes brilliant with no hint of welcome. Could he make her understand? Matt wondered in confusion. I'm sorry, ma'am, he began. I know you don't want me to come here. I need help. Atien's dog is caught in a trap, a steel trap. I tried to open it, but the dog won't let me near it. The woman stared at him. He could not tell whether she had understood a word. He started to speak again when the deerskin curtain was pushed aside and a second figure stood in the doorway. It was a girl with long black braids hanging over her shoulders. She was dressed in blue with broad bands of red and white beading. Strange, Matt thought. How much alike they looked, the old woman and the girl, standing side by side so straight and proud. Me, Marie, sister of Atien, the girl said in a soft, low voice. Grandmother not understand. I tell what you say. Matt repeated what he had said and then waited impatiently while she spoke to her grandmother. The woman listened. Finally, her grim lips parted in a single, scornful phrase. Aramis Pizwat, she said. Good for nothing dog. Matt's awe vanished in anger. Tell her maybe it is good for nothing, he ordered the girl. Atien is fond of it, and it's hurt, hurt bad. We've got to get it out of that trap. There was distress in the girl's eyes as she turned again to her grandmother. He could see that she was pleading, and that in spite of herself, the old woman was relenting. After a shoot after a few short words, the girl went into the cabin and came back in a moment, holding in her hand a large chunk of meat, a small blanket folded over her arm. Me go with you, she said. Dog know me. In his relief, Matt forgot the torn hand he had been holding behind him. 
Instantly, the old woman moved forward and snatched at it. Her eyes questioned him. It's nothing, he said hastily. I almost got the trap open. She gave his arm a tug, commanding him to follow her. There isn't time, he protested. She silenced him with a string of words of which she understood only the scornful pizwat. She say dog not go away, the girl explained. Better you come. Trap maybe make poison. Having no choice, Matt followed them into the cabin. He saw now that the woman's straight posture had been a matter of pride. She was really very lame and stooped as she walked ahead of him. While she busied herself over the fire, he sat obediently on a low platform and looked about him. He was astonished that the little room, strange and so unlike his mother's kitchen, seemed beautiful. It was very clean. The walls were lined with birch bark and hung with woven mats and baskets of intricate design. The air was sweet with fresh grasses spread on the earth floor. Without speaking, the woman tended him, washing his hand with clean, warm water. From a painted gourd, she scooped a pungent-smelling paste and spread it over the wound, then bound his hand with a length of clean blue cotton. Thank you, Matt said when she had finished. It feels better. She dismissed him with a grunting imitation of Sockneys's good. The girl who had been watching moved swiftly to the door. As Matt rose to follow her, the grandmother held out to him a slab of cornbread. He had not realized how hungry he was, and he accepted it gratefully. The girl took the lead, brushing aside the curious children and the still suspicious dogs. At the river's edge, she untied a small canoe, and Matt stepped into it, thankful that his half-dried clothes would not have to be drenched again. Once on the forest trail, she set the pace, and he did not find it easy to keep up with her swift, silent stride. She was so like Atienne, though lighter and more graceful. After a time, Matt ventured to break the silence. You speak good English, he said. Atienne, tell me about you, she answered. You tell him good story. Atienne didn't tell me he had a sister. The girl laughed. Atienne thinks squaw girl not good for much, she said. Atienne only like to hunt. I have a sister, too, he told her. She's coming soon. What's she name? Sarah. She's younger than you, but Marie isn't an Indian name, is it? Matt asked. Is Christian name. Me baptized by father. Atienne had never mentioned a priest either, but Matt knew that the French Jesuits had lived with the Indians here in Maine long before the English settlers came. When my sister comes, will you come with Atienne to see her? He asked. It might be so, she answered politely. She sounded as though it never would be. At last they heard the yelping just ahead of them and they both began to run. Even in his terror, the dog recognized the girl and greeted her with a frantic beating of his tail. He gulped at the meat she held out to him, but he still would not let either of them touch the trap. The girl had come prepared for this, and she unfolded the blanket she had carried, threw it over the dog's head, and gathered the folds behind him. With surprising strength, she held the struggling bundle tightly in her arms while Matt took the trap in both hands and slowly forced the jaws open. In a moment, the dog was free, escaping the blanket, bounding away from them on three legs, the fourth paw dangling at an odd angle. I'm afraid it's broken, Matt said. He was still breathing hard from the last run and from the effort of tugging those steel jaws apart. Atien mend, the girl said, folding up the blanket as calmly as though she were simply tidying up a cabin. The dog hobbled slowly after them along the trail, lying down now and then to lick at the bleeding paw. They made slow progress, and now that the worry was over, Matt was aware how tired he was. It seemed as though he had been walking back and forth over that trail all day, and the way to the village seemed endless. He was thankful when, halfway to the river, he saw Atienne approaching swiftly along the trail. 
My grandmother sent me, he explained. You get dog out? I couldn't do it alone, Matt admitted. Atien stood watching as the dog came limping toward him. Dog very stupid, he said. No good for hunt. No good for smell, turtle smell. What for I take back such foolish dog? His harsh words did not fool Matt for a moment, nor did they fool the dog. The scruffy tail thumped joyfully against the earth. The brown eyes looked up at the Indian boy with adoration. Atien reached into his pouch and brought out a strip of dried meat. Then he bent and very gently took the broken paw into his hands.